The young big three of Darius Garland, Evan Mobley, and now Donovan Mitchell makes up one of the most dynamic trios across the association, with each being able to complement one another in terms of playing style. However, Cleveland had to give up potentially six future first round picks. D. Mitch proved himself with playoff 50 pieces one after the other against Jamal Murray two years ago in the bubble. He gets severely hated on by soy boys, but Donovan was the best player for a Jazz team that was at least a top six seed in the West in every year he played for them, and he even led the Jazz to a number one seed in 2021. With that said, Mitchell's chemistry with Rudy Gobert on both ends of the court ultimately was the downfall for that particular era of Jazz basketball. From Utah's side of things, GM Danny Ainge got a nice return by picking up Stretch Big and Lori Markkinen and a 20-plus point-per-game score in Colin Sexton. But this video breaks down the questions from the Cavaliers' perspective. Was the gamble worth it for Kobe Altman and this Cavalier organization? And is the backcourt of Mitchell and Darius Garland too small? Valid concerns. However, the post-LeBron era rebuild has gone pretty damn well, as the Cavs have nicely picked up the pieces with savvy draft picks, signings, and acquisitions. This year's Cavs are now equipped with the ideal blend of talent in terms of the backcourt and up front. But can Cleveland overcome early chemistry issues that every new squad inevitably faces? Before answering that question, thanks to the 10.3% of you watching right now who are subscribed, but if you're in the 90% that aren't, help the channel reach 80k. We're so close to achieving that mark, and I can't thank each and every one of you enough for the love you've been showing this content. Now let's get into this. The reason Cleveland was able to outbid New York in the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes is because the Knicks weren't willing to give up three unprotected first round picks. Not only did the Cavs give up that, but they also traded two future pick swaps, as well as this year's 14th overall pick in OK Abaji. Giving up all that along with two solid current NBAers and Sexton and Markkanen is something almost no GM would want to give up. That's why Kevin Durant's trade demand wasn't granted and it's why the negotiations for Donovan Mitchell took forever. Now the Jazz are set up perfectly for the future, and just like Danny Ainge rebuilt the Boston Celtics by drafting Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and the Time Lord, he's on track to end up granting the same type of success for Utah. With that clear, on the other side for Cleveland, you still have to admit the addition of Donovan Mitchell makes the Eastern Conference that much more generationally great, for the 2022-23 season. The East is composed of bona fide contenders like Boston, Milwaukee, Miami, Philadelphia, and Brooklyn, plus teams you can't sleep on like Toronto, Chicago, and Atlanta. Even the typically bottom-feeding New York Knicks have some hope with their mid-three of Brunson, Randall, and Barrett, including these Cavs, and there's legitimately nine or ten teams in this conference who are composed of the star power and depth to go deep into the playoffs. This is the most we're going to see Donovan Mitchell off the ball throughout his entire career, and he's actually a fairly worse spot-up three-point shooter than the Cavs' former two-guard in Colin Sexton. In 2021, before he got hurt for a year, Colin made 41.2% on three-pointers where he took zero dribbles, and in 21-22, D. Mitch shot 35.3% on spot-ups. Mitchell did shoot those shots at a slightly higher frequency and is still a very capable floor spacer, but there's going to be a lot of times when Garland's saucing up the defense off the bounce, and the Cavs are going to need Mitchell to be running off pin downs and generally spotting up around the perimeter, whether that's on either wing or corner, almost like he's Cleveland's Clay Thompson. Next to the ball dominant Garland, it'll be interesting to see how much Mitchell is willing to sacrifice in terms of his shot attempts and overall touches. I actually think it'll be intriguing to see Donovan get to cut back door and catch defenses sleeping with posters. Also, the extra ball handling of Darius should keep Donovan that much more fresh. I do worry about his catch and shoot ability, however. Getting back to his athleticism, Donovan's springiness is right there with John ja Morant and Russell Westbrook as one of the modern game's most explosive backcourt players. Most players Donovan matches up with can't come close to matching his speed, downhill momentum, and hang time, which lead to some of the NBA's best Kodak moments. A 37-inch vertical jump and a freaky for a 6'1 frame, 7-foot wingspan makes the Dwayne Wade-esque Spida unstoppable with a full head of steam. 
But there's been many concerns around the NBA universe revolving around how having two players with a below average six foot one frame in the backcourt is going to fare for Cleveland defensively. Expect lengthy, more physically imposing wings and guards to attack Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland at will. We'll get back to the backcourt's defensive efficiency, but on the other end, it was impressive how the Vanderbilt product Darius Garland had the stamina to play his most dominant basketball in the final month of the regular season and into the play-in. While the Cavs lost to Brooklyn in that game, Darius kept the Cavs within striking distance by dropping a team most by far 34 points. April is when most players are either resting up for the postseason or physically gassed from the 82-game grind, but albeit in a limited 5-outing sample size, that month saw Garland average 23.2 points, 7.6 dimes, and 1.6 steals per game, making an absolutely unheard of 51.6% of his 6-plus triples per game. What stands out most with Darius Garland is the man's array of shifty dangles in ISO situations. Following hard inside-out hezzies to fake step-backs and drives, Garland's low-sweep ball pickups and ambidextrous finishing around the basket complement those dribble combos. Despite being undersized, his ability to use his balance and footwork to lean back on his matchup to create space from them gives you flashbacks of John Stockton. Big switching on to Darius should realistically just fall down, as the combinations Garland can hit mismatches with should be illegal. This ability to nastily break down anyone off the dribble in one-on-ones with elite ball handling and speed off that bounce, combined with how Garland can swiftly transition from his handle to his jumper, is why you're starting to see people say that Darius has Stephen Curry upside. Watch this innovative changing hand Smitty move just in front of half court, leading into a moving one-legged fadeaway on the baseline. After getting the switch onto Cat, this fundamentally sound reset of the offense after initially not getting what he wanted, displays Garland's ability to stay poised under pressure. Generally, it's the smooth operation in terms of how Darius elusively mixes up perimeter jumpers and relentlessly quick attacks to the rim, which keep defenses falsely guessing about any day of the week. In terms of the defensive end for the backcourt, Mitchell may be short for a shooting guard, but he's got above average power forward type muscle and solid lateral quickness. He's not the greatest help defender, but was still good enough to rank 7th among shooting guards in defensive rating last season. The Jazz have been a top team on this end for years, and Mitchell's been an under-talked about contributor to that. Darius Garland doesn't have a reputation for his defense either, but his defensive rating was only 0.5 higher than a reputable guard stopper in Drew Holiday. The advanced stats display that Garland and Mitchell are undervalued stoppers in their own right. To help keep the backcourt in prime condition throughout the regular season and potentially a deep 2023 playoff run, the Cavs will have Ricky Rubio back to provide his patented playmaking and underrated shot creation off the bench like the newest Boston Celtic Danilo Gallinari tragically just did. Back in December, Gallo's fellow European Ricky Rubio tore his ACL. The re-addition of Rubio is going to be massive, as before he went down, the 17-year pro was posting a career high in points per game. However, Rubio's efficiency from the field was at a measly 36.3%, and the Cavs' offensive rating was worse in the 34 games that Rubio played. In comparison to the 48, that he didn't. That proves the number one playmaker Darius Garland is more than capable of picking up the slack. However, the reason Rubio's a luxury comes down to his Malcolm Brogdon, Steve Nash-esque wherewithal to keep his dribble alive through the paint, even if he has an open layup, and then find a teammate after resetting the offense. Cleveland had a 20-14 record with Ricky, as opposed to a 20-20 record without him, and it's safe to say the Cavs desperately missed his team's second best 6.6 assists per game, and team best 1.4 steals per night. Stats aside, Rubio's ability to keep the Cavaliers flow in check was severely missed when he went down around the midway point of last season. Rubio's fellow veteran off the bench in the longest tenured Cavalier, Kevin Love, is coming off a season where he played the most games of his career since the 2015-16 campaign. In 2021-22, Love made 39.2% of his 6.4 triples per night, marking his third most efficient three-point shooting season 
of his 14-year career. Taking him late in a fantasy draft wouldn't be the worst decision. Kevin seems to have a whole lot left in the tank. Moving on to potentially the best big man prospect across the entire association and the runner-up for Rookie of the Year, Evan Mobley. We'll get to Evan's quickness and versatility, but in terms of his old-school rim protection, not only did Evan's 1.7 blocks per game lead the Cavaliers, but that mark was 7th best among all NBA centers. Mobley combines above average shot blocking with a 45.5% shooting stroke from 10 to 16 feet. Evan's shooting chart was extremely balanced as 36% of his total shots were from the paint, 30% of them were from 3 to 10 feet, 14.3% of his attempts were from 10 to 16 feet. Evan's offensive bag consists of elite triple threat moves, fine-tuned drop steps, and generally nifty post work. When he changes ends, Evan can guard in drop coverage or switch on to smaller players in pick and rolls, evident awareness that made it hard to believe the kid was only a rookie. When looking at Mobley's trajectory, given he was fourth among all players in contested shots, only behind San Antonio's Jakob Pertl, Denver's Nikola Jokic, and now Minnesota's new DPOY Rudy Gobert, the man has the potential to be one of the best defenders in the association. And it's Mobley becoming that much more switchable of a defender that's most scary from my perspective as a Raptor fan because the USC product's repertoire comprised of extra effort, freaky length, and ability to take up ground in an instant, all paired with a few years of experience, could eventually allow Evan to guard positions 1 through 5. First-time All-Star and former Brooklyn Net Jared Allen provided a similar backline of defense for the likes of Darius Garland, and he'll do the same for Donovan Mitchell. On the other end, given Mitchell's an above-average facilitator, Donovan and Allen, or Donovan and Mobley, should be a solid pick-and-roll combo. Then again, Mitchell didn't get along with his last big man in Gobert, so it'll be interesting to see how his chemistry plays out between Mobley and Allen. Cavaliers GM Kobe Altman certainly took a massive risk in giving up three future first-rounders, one draft pick from this year, and two future pick swaps, but the bottom line is, the rebuild was complete, the Cavs found their guy in Garland, so it was a solid move to go out and get a backcourt partner for him that'll complement him nicely. In terms of the defensive question marks, it helps that Darius and Donovan can rely on the backside defense of two players who ranked at least top 16 in block shots per game last year to rotate over to the weak side for swats. I'm predicting the Cavs ceiling this season is a number 2 or number 3 seed, and if they stay healthy, Cleveland is at the very worst a number 5 or 6 seed. But did the Cavs get this risk right in your opinion? Best answer down below in the comments, guess next video shout out, and the top 5 commenters by September 21st earn free merchandise of their choosing. Two shoutouts from my last upload and this one in my next video. If you're already subscribed and want to support the growth of my channel even more, please feel free to click the link in the description to go follow at dflowhoops on Instagram and Twitter. Regardless, you're the best for sticking around this far, and whenever you see this video, I hope you have a great one.